and say Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Now when we get into this book, this is a book written in the eyes of man. This is not a book that you go run to start a church, start a doctrine. You must finish this book completely. All the way to the last chapter and the last verse. There's a lot of isms in this book. A lot of teachings. And some of them I'll tell you if I can pronounce the names thereof. Or maybe I'll spell the names of some of them that I can't pronounce. But this is a worldly vision writing of a godly man as far as what he can see on this planet, on this earth, in life. So you guys treat this book with caution and realize it's under the Old Testament as we begin to study. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Well, David had many sons, and only one of his sons were king, so that would be Solomon. Solomon was a king, he was a preacher. And if you remember, God gave Solomon a blank check one day, and Solomon asked for wisdom and understanding for, for God's people, and God gave it to him. Vanity is something that's empty. Worthless. And it's going to show up in this book over and over. So when you look at life just through the pair of your eyeballs that God's given you. Vanity. Peter says it's all going to burn up. It's all going to go away. Being the December 25th, whatever that means, everything you got today is going to go away unless it's eternal life by Jesus Christ. I wonder how many people of your family or of the families today, by you opening up your mouth, receive the eternal gift by Jesus Christ, which is the gift of God, rather than the junk you got from the store. How many people got saved today? Everything else is vanity. And you'll know because a lot of people will be at the stores tomorrow returning to vanity. Listen, go, go to the store. You'll find more aisles open for the return than for buying. So December 26th is a great illustration of what this book is talking about. Somebody put their heart in to buy something for you and you don't even care enough to, you know. All is vanity. That's the theme of this book. Let's go run and start a church. Eat, drink, and be merry. Vanity. Philippians 4.11 and Ephesians 2.11. What profit has a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? It's not eternal. That rich man that, that hey, I'm going to tear down my barns, I'm going to rebuild, I'm going to restart and go bigger. What's that going to do in eternity when God says, thou fool? Death will come to your doorstep. Then whatever you had in those barns, what are they going to do in eternity? Exodus twenty twenty five. Under the sun. This book, again, is written in the eyes of man, the worldly point of view. And I can see, I don't think we're going to be doing chapter every night. We're going to be breaking this down. Whatever you do. You reach for that corporate ladder. You reach to pay for your family's food. You reach to buy that extra boat, that extra car, whatever is it under the sun. Now let me ask you a question. When that sun comes up in the course of the morning and goes down at the course of night, 365 days in the year, I don't care if it's cloudy, rainy, all that. The sun still comes up and still goes down. How many gravestones have that sun cast its shadow upon? And it, listen, if, even if you're a bum and you don't work, you have labor. 
Thank God the government will give you a uh, will give you a welfare check. You still got to go to the grocery and buy your own your own goods. They haven't made it so that you know it's it's brought to your house. You actually got to get up and do something at least once a month. For what? You realize if, if you were to eat at the top notch steakhouse or eat at the the, the the Mickey D's or Burger King, do you realize what you put into your mouth, no matter what, goes to the same place to be clean? I don't care if it's in a in a fine luxury castle mansion bathroom. To an outhouse in the middle of the woods, or even out in the open in the field somewhere. The food and drink for all mankind ends up in particularly the same place as waste, and that's what the word is for: it's waste. Everything else is going to be burnt up. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. What's so hard about the Bible? I'm going to die one day, and the generation of my children, they're going to rise up, they're going to have children, and my children will pass away. On and on and on, until... When the Lord calls it all, end. When the heavens are wrapped up in the earth, it, it, it fervent heat. It says, but the earth abideth forever. And it's not eternal life. Remember, we're talking about a book here that looks at the earth and looks at the world. We're not looking at the heavenly. You know, you, like you said, you go run over to Peter. Well, see, look, the earth doesn't last forever. Ha, ha, ha. That's, we're not looking at eternal things. We're not looking at spiritual things. So, the forever here is when the earth is completely gone. That's the forever time. Eternity has no time. There is coming a time when, when time will end. Over and over and over to the earth is dissolved. People are going to be. The sun also rises. The sun goes down. And hasteth to his place where he arose. Psalms 19, Malachi chapter 4. Hasteth. Haven't you realized the older you get? And some of you, you, you got to be around my age to appreciate this. That as time goes on, time gets quicker. Listen, it is the same six hours, Jewish time. Twelve hours, excuse me, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's what I meant. Twelve hours. That sun doesn't want to, you know, start racing across the sky. But when you're in your 40s, like I am, there are times that sun just seems, phew, it's gone. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like time just speeds on? Here we are, we're coming to the end of another year. Where did it go? And Solomon wrote that for us. Even Solomon, back in 977 B.C., where, you know, that's the date in my Bible, felt the same way. The wind goeth towards the south, and turns about to the north. It whirls about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Isaiah 40:21. Oh, the people in the Bible, they were just so stupid. And yet, about 977 B.C., Solomon knows about the circuits of wind. When did science find it out? 
When did science learn that there were certain movements and certain paths of the wind? Yet yeah, it's found in the King James 1611 Bible. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Now you may say right now, yeah, all rivers don't run into the sea. I mean, the Mississippi River runs into the Gulf of Mexico. That's not a sea. Ho, 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 ho. We ain't done. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Solomon is talking about something. When did science catch up to evaporation and precipitation? Water rains. It goes back up. And rain somewhere else. Eventually, water will reach the seas, the oceans, the rivers. And where Solomon's writing, oh, the Jordan River reaches down to the Dead Sea. Duh! Look at a map. Look at the seas in the areas of, of Israel. And see where they run to. And when you get to the Atlantic Ocean, cut it in half. Because half of the Atlantic Ocean, all the way over to China, they didn't know it was there. We're right in 977 B BC, thereabouts. There, Christopher Columbus, they ain't nowhere near to be found. See, we got to run to the Bible's wrong. The Bible's wrong. We don't ever give the Bible the benefit of the doubt. We keep putting Americanism into the Bible, and there is no Americanism. It's Hebrewism. It's Israelite. Jewish. By the way, the picture that you see, I, I give credit to, and if you don't want it me, I, I will take it off. I apologize. Is the first Jewish assembly temple in America right next door to the first Baptist Church in America that's the first congregational place where the Jews were allowed to meet and assemble in America in Rhode Island give you a little information on that all things are full labor man cannot utter it the eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing, Acts 7.21. Everything you got to do is labor. The beginning of life is called what? Labor. For your mother. Labor pains. You've got to do something. Listen, I don't care if you're a dead bum and don't do nothing. you got to labor to breathe. you got to labor your heart to be. You can't completely say I'm worthless. Your body is functioned and designed by God to work. And to do work to take care of your body. You can't just stand under the shower head and, and not apply soap to you. You're just stand underneath the shower. Okay, I'm clean. No. You got to do work. You can't just have somebody put a plate of food down in front of you and not do work to put it to your mouth. And yet when we went through Proverbs, there was a person in there, you know, he's too lazy to put the food to his own mouth. Your eyes. Okay, I got this phone. Yay! Oh, you got a new one? I want that one. Oh, you got that one? I want a new one. Oh, I got to wait in line for three hours for this one? I got to wait. And you're not satisfied. And don't tell me if you're going to, oh, if I win the million dollars, I'm going to be satisfied with that. No, you're not. The Bible says that you are not satisfied because of lust of the eyes and advertising will advertise to you and make you want things you don't need. And you've got to stop. The Bible says over and over to be content with food and raiment. 
And yet we are in a generation of junk. You know, from the first early settlers of America after Christmas was made non-lawful, because you do know Christmas was, was, was against the law early in America. You were to take the presents that they gave at that point to what the presents were, were given today, there'd be a quite a bit of a change. Peace and goodwill to all men. And you got cops showing up at the grocery stores and at the stores because people are battling out for a TV. What's the problem? Your eyes are not content. You as a Christian has no business with that. Your eyes are supposed to be on Jesus, not pagan festivities. Why do you gotta have all that junk under the tree? Why do you gotta have all that money spent? And then you wait to see what your eyes haven't seen, that big bill you're gonna get. Now you gotta work more hours to, to pay. And you gotta skip church to pay. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. This is the first law of thermodynamics. Which the Bible follows and not evolution. Hi. How you doing? Yeah, I'm at the grocery store right now. What is it you want? Okay, can of beans. Got the can of beans. Where you want news? I got the news. You think that's new? That's not new. When I was a little boy. My mom would give me a slip of paper: milk, eggs, cheese, and a candy bar or soda, whatever you want, whatever left over. That piece of paper is the same thing. Okay, yeah. And spaghetti sauce. Which one? There's so many here. Don't tell me I work in a grocery store. That uh, yeah, what do you need? It's the same thing as my mom writing it down on a piece of paper. Yeah, but we you know, we can carry phones around and stuff like that. Solomon had phones too. No. Yeah, he did. Piece of paper written down. Here, General, here's your orders. Give that to the to the, 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 the captain of the army. That's the same thing as a, as a, as a, a walkie-talkie or a radio. Move the team into position and aim and fire. That's the same thing as, as writing it down. You know what Peter said? He said, we were on the Mount Transfiguration one day, God. This is my beloved son, and I am all pleased. That's a, isn't that a cell phone, radio, kind of CB thing? And But what did Peter say? The sure word of, writ of written down was more sure than God's voice. Read that what Peter said. You are in a fabrication kind of world today where my mom writing it down on a piece of paper was more sure than the telephone. The government could have slipped in there and said, get some of our products there that needs more money. Oh, you said uh, you get x -Lax. I didn't say x -Lax. I heard x -Lax. You know, government can sleep into your televonical, you know, electronical things and keep track of your cards and all that, what you're buying. Written down is more sure. Back when I was a child, you could take two cans of the string and you can play telephone. Now you cut the string and you cut the string and you would have canless phone or cordless wireless phone. No, that didn't work. Yeah, you hold one can to your, to, your, to your face, the other one held it to his ear and say, Hi! That was our cell phone. Cordless. My mom had a, my mom had a cordless phone. 
When I was growing up in New London, my mom used a cordless phone to call me. No, oh, they weren't no yes, she did. Stop! I heard her. No matter where I was, I heard her. There's nothing new. It's the same. I don't care if it's version eight or twenty thousand million. It's the same. Communication is communication. And if all the satellites fell from the heavens and all the electricity were turned off, you would go right back to the handwriting, if you know how to write handwriting. So there's nothing new. Automobiles is not new. Man has been getting around since Adam and Eve. How did Adam and Eve get around? How did they get from point A to point B? Automobile. They use their feet. Yeah, but I have a Ford. I have a Chrysler. But don't you use your feet? One for the gas and one for the pedal. Hmm? Well, horse and buggy. Didn't you use horse's feet? See, now we're moving to transportation. We move from the ears and the mouth to transportation. You use your feet. Just like Adam and Eve. Yet we're more fatter than Adam and Eve and all those that walk. Nothing new under the sun. You can't say, look, it's new and it approved. We've always had dish laundry, dish laundry, uh, dish laundry, dish detergent soap. We've always had something to wash our clothes. We've always had clothes since God killed the first animal in the figs. Nothing new. There's nothing new of, of killing since Cain and Abel. We just can kill more people with, with one single weapon. Whoopie do! Oh, we came with advancements of submarines. How many whales, dolphins, and fish have visited the underwaters that God created? Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. Yeah, appetite. Look, new and improved. Wait a minute. You come up with a problem that says new and improved. Are you telling me that the old product that I had was inferior? How do I know it's new and approved? You know, just slapping a label on there. How do I know my dog food is actually going to taste like chicken? You think I'm going to taste it? See, I know you can take words and you can deceive me. It has been already of old time, which was before us. It's always been around. And it's been around since Adam and Eve. You just put a twist on it. You put a name. Listen. They give it great names. When I grew up, my first job was in was a store. It had a store manager. Today, he's a director. He's as stupid as, as, as ever, as not as smart as my manager was. I had store managers that were that were. Man, they taught me things. I, you got people today with names given to them today, and, and a custodian. Excuse me, sir. I I spilt some stuff on aisle A. Well, go clean it yourself. That's your job. Well, no, no, I don't do that. But you're the the custodial floor technician, and you don't know how to clean uh, the beats on the floor in aisle eight. I've got to clean it. We give great names and it's the same thing. 
I mean, we would probably give a great name to Adam and Eve, the original human uh, reproducer. Still a man and a woman. We give it colorful names. Shacking up. No adultery or fornication. It's the same thing. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. How did he sh shave? What's your electric razor going to be 3,000 years from now? That thing that you have to now give, you have to go work extra hours because of today. It's going to do you what in 200 years? I think all effort that Abraham Lincoln put into being president of the United States and the Civil War has done him what today? 2014, December 25th. What good is it doing him today? And let me ask you a question. We have a president of the United States of America today, okay? What did they call the Indian chief leaders that were the natives of America before we came? What was their title? Some of you don't know and don't care. What you put big value on today, tomorrow may mean nothing. Belshazzar, oh Babylon, look, in one night, destroyed, gone, death. You know, he never, as far as, we, as far as we read, he never tried to sober up from that party that night. And we can assume he just went right to bed and... You know, he never had time to, to, to give up the drinking and, and, and worship the big porcelain, whatever they threw up in. He was dead. His empire was gone. You, you remember Babylon? You remember the Tower of Babel? You know in Eliminac uh, that, that attacked Israel? What are those things? I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And it can only be Solomon. Isaiah 24, 23, I have on that. I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom that God had given him. I'm trying to find where this note is. I have. He's seeking out by wisdom, not by head. That God has given. He, he by God, is going to look around and see what life is on this earth. A lot of people want to try that, but they don't want to use. They want to use it for fun. A philosophy is what a man thinks about life without God, Jesus, Bible. But philosophy comes from the Bible with God, Jesus, in the Bible. So this is not philosophy of Solomon. This is wisdom of God. With God, the word given to him. Wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. Under heaven. 
Not in heaven, in, not above the heavens in the uh, solar system, not where God's dwelling is. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised thereof. James 3.13 The wisdom. The under heaven, the materialism. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Vexation is an irritation. Solomon's seen it all. And he didn't need to be in 2014. Matter of fact, what he saw was all hand labor. He didn't see cranes and bulldozers. And yet they had highways, the king's highway. They had trade routes. They had ships. They had seaports. He saw it all. He saw all the trades. And he said, it is an irritation. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. He's, oh, it's, it's vain. It's empty. You know, you can build a house of all the money you got. Nice, best materials. And have no one care for it, have no one live in it, have no one take care of it, and have no one put no money into it. And go look at what that place looks at it looks like in ten years. Untouched by man. It's vain. A house that today may have a family and children and joy and peace and gladness and, and celebrations and tragedies and death and hardships. An entire family dies and the house just sits and rots. Or a pipe may have to be fixed because it would be a leak. The roof had to be fixed because of a leak. The toilet may have to be fixed because it doesn't work right. And mother cleaned the floors and mother took care of the stove and took care of the drawers. Then the, the clothes were hanged properly in the, in the closets. And this needed paint and this needed patching. And when it's all gone, it just falls apart. It defies the teaching of evolution, the Ecclesiastes teaches. It doesn't get better. When you look at yourself in the mirror years by years and years, you're not getting better. It amazes me, you take a couple who are just married in their teens, 18, 19, 20, and you start them off in an apartment. And you open up that medicine cabinet. And there's nothing in there. It's an empty medicine cabinet. And as they move from the apartments to houses and all that, let them take that medicine cabinet with them. And when they're 40, 50, 60 years old, that same medicine cabinet, open it up and see what's in there now. It's full of drugs. It's full of pills. It's full of medicine because we're getting better and brighter and greater. We're not. And death is coming. How much money is spent to put makeup on, on a person and, and all these things to make yourself look good and better? Was it beauty is vain? 
let me read this one properly again. Proverbs 31 says, Favor is deceit through beauty is vain, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised, we learn. You put all this stuff on you. And you're going to die. And I, I was amazed when, when I was dealing with the death of my wife. And they have it where the night before you can you come in and you view the body. You know you we had an open cast. And I looked and I said, wait a minute, that's that's not her. She never did her nails. She never. But when the body changes colors and stuff like that, stuff like that had to be done. You're dressing up a corpse. For what? You put a corpse in a, in a suit for what? This is the most stupidest thing for an atheist to be buried in a suit and to visit a God that he doesn't believe in. You put a, a, a Jehovah Witnesses, whatever you call her, in a nice dress. And she's not going nowhere for eternity. As far as Psalm is writing this book. We have gone to the eternal. We're looking at. There's the coffin. It's got a body. What did that body earn? Absolutely nothing. No matter how much deodorant you put on that body, in a few days, uh, 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 Martha says, in four days, he stinketh. That's what we're looking at. We're not looking at the eternal state. We're looking at from birth to that grave. He had the first dimensional, whatever they call that, that television set. Who cares? He had a car for each day of the week. Who cares? When you're looking at him in that coffin, who cares? You need to read every verse and every chapter of this book. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. And that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Wanting. You know, if you were to write down everything that somebody wants, make it a list, check it. Oh, look at that. There's Santa Claus. Can you imagine if you were to write down everything that every kid asked Santa Claus for this year? And then write down everything Christians Ask God for in prayer. Not to say, not also talk about the atheist, what he wants. The Buddhist, what he wants. The wife, what she wants. The husband, what he wants. The children, what they want. How many people are in the world today, and what do they want? Give them a, 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 a packet of paper and have them write down everything they want. That's what's being said. Um, I skipped over. Let's see. Verse 13, you find cosmology. Verse 15, you find futurism. F U T I L I S M. Wanting. I commune with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem and all the world, the Bible records for Solomon. Yea, my heart 
had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Imperialism. He got his wisdom and knowledge from God. Great estate. You realize under David and under Solomon, they had all that God had promised Israel from the from the river of Egypt all the way over to the uh, uh, Euphrates. Everything was in their hands. No other king of Israel could have said that. Great experience. Two women came up to him. You ever wonder if Solomon after that, give me a sword off the fire. You imagine Solomon, just, he's all by himself. Oh, that was weird. <laughs> what would I have done if that woman had, would I have really chopped that baby in half? Yet the child went home with his mother that afternoon, that night, whatever it was. I gave my heart, never head, because he's dealing with God. A worldly man will go to a shrink and deal with the head and get no answers. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. See, he's doing this not to be fleshy. He's not doing this to be worldly. He's not being sensible. He's not He's not creating and searching his lust. He's doing it for God. And God said, hey, I need a godly philosopher. Go ahead, Solomon. Do it. For the honor and glory of God and the word. One of those shrinks, the famous shrinks that they had, died of cancer of the mouth from smoking cigars. You're going to tell me about the deep feelings of the mind and all that, and you couldn't get over your own lust? I gave my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. How many times is the word folly mentioned in Proverbs? I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. Irritation of spirit. To go search out by wisdom. I'm going to study on how not to how not to do things and how how to be an ignoramus. I'm going to study that. Colleges will give you. For in much wisdom is much grief. Uh oh. The more wise you get, the more grief. Solomon says. Now, what exactly does that know? I don't know. I haven't reached that point. But I have reached some points. At one time in my life, I was never a father. One day, I became a father. One Another day, I became a father again. And I have learned things. And I realized one day, my children will have pain and sorrow themselves, and that hurts. One day I was single, li living in my own place, and I got married. I learned how to be a husband. And grief realized that the death of a loved one. I learned that true love hurts. And I got married again. And I learned that pain of a loved one hurts. Because you can't do nothing. Much wisdom. 
I grew, I'm growing in the Lord. I'm in his work daily. I'm trying to do what he tells me to do. And grief is, I know Christians who have hurt me, who have turned away from me, who have rejected me because I want to do right. That's grief. I know what God wants. I'm not perfect. I'm not in perfection. And he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. Jesus Christ had all the wisdom and, and, and knowledge of he, he is God. He bore our afflictions. He was a man of sorrows, the Bible says. Solomon says much in verse 18. I only know about love and pain and, 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 and death and people leaving me. I wonder about these people that go to colleges. And get all the education and get the degrees and, and go on and on and on. The grief. I know the more they get money, the more they get in, in, they get insecurity. The bigger house, the more the more alarm system and the bigger safe you gotta get. And they're gonna uh, they're gonna take my wife and ransom her for money, my children. I know that. Read what Paul says about the love of money. Money and education is not the answer. Now, I'm not going against education. Everybody needs an education. But we live in a nonsense world today that says we will only hire experience. Well, where do you get the experience to get hired? Walk into the guy who's interviewing you and you won't get the job. Say, well, excuse me, sir. Well, where do you get the experience? And why should you not give me your experience to do the job that you want? A materialistic world makes no sense at all. New and approved. Well, how do we know? So you've been selling us less inferior stuff. Thank you very much. I grew up with a cereal that was, wasn't the new and improved and best and all fortified and all that. Thank you very much. I'm glad it took you 20 years. There are 10 vanities in the book of Ecclesiastes. I know I'm saying it wrong. But I had a guy walk out of prison one time because I, I don't pronounce the word correctly. All the words in the Bible, that one word, a few others. Have. Wisdom. 2.13 Labor. 219. Purpose. 226. Ambition. 44. Fun. 76. Fame. 416. Money. 510. Selfishness. 47. Coveting. 69. Rewards. 810. And we haven't even gotten. We're only touching the iceberg. We're in chapter 1 and we just started. We're talking about emptiness.
All is vanity. Chapter 1. What is vanity? All is vanity. My job. Vanity. My pension. You know how many people don't have pensions anymore that thought they had a pension? My children. You know how people got children that, that just turned to be rejects and, and scum of the earth? My house. Decay, fall away, vanity. Money. Ain't worth the value of what's, what's written on the note. Vanity. Your own life. You're going to be in a grave one day. The Lord tarries. Vanity. Empty. Nothing. Everything on December 25th. That tree is going to be put out in the front lawn. Well, we got an artificial one. It'll eventually end up in the front lawn. <coughs> Those gifts will be forgotten, traded, warped, break, fade, rip, tear, get outdated. The paper will be thrown away. The meal will be digested and you know what happens to a meal. Your family and friends will go away and on the airplane, the car, the train, whatever they take, they'll be talking about you. And you won't even remember what happened last Christmas. There's only one thing that will last. All that is done for Jesus Christ. That's not being. So as far as from the grave, all the way back to birth. From the birth to the grave. What we're looking at is vanity. What Solomon says. What the Bible says. What the Holy Spirit has written to us. Vanity. In this book. Shows up 33 times. Vanity shows up four times. Thirty-seven times the word vanity shows up. In twenty-nine verses. In eight verses, it's repeated. There are eight verses that vanity shows up twice. Thirty-seven verses of two hundred and twenty-two. Is vanity. Anything else here before we close? But that's what it comes down to. Vanity is vanity.